Welcome to Disciple Dojo. This is an awesome episode today, guys. I got to sit down and talk with Dr. Matthew Halstead. He wrote this new book, The End of the World as You Know It, What the Bible Really Says About the End Times and why it's good news. This is coming out beginning of February. You may be watching this, it may already be out, but you can pre-order it now. This was one of the last books I read last year, and it was one of the best books I read last year. This is, you'll hear me say in our discussion, people have asked me to write a book on eschatology. This, I don't need to anymore. This is the book I would write if I were to write a book on eschatology. It's very rare that I come across a book where I'm like, man, I'm tracking on, literally everything that the author is saying, but this is an example. So I was excited to sit down and talk with Matthew about his book. You'll hear in the discussion, I'm going to make frequent mention to Disciple Dojo resources. The reason is because this is an area where from the very beginning, from way before Disciple Dojo was even a nonprofit, when it was literally just the name of my blog, eschatology has been one of the areas that, that I'm passionate about getting people equipped in. And mainly because, as we mentioned in the discussion, there's just so much junk out there clogging up people's understandings of eschatology. You have preachers and authors and teachers making money hand over fist, selling fear and selling anxiety and selling confident sounding predictions that turn out to be nonsense. And as a result, Christians end up looking gullible and foolish. So Matt's book was an antidote to that. And so I want to point Dojo readers to it. I want to give you some background to the author. I want you to meet Matthew and see what he's like and listen to this discussion where we talk about this issue that people either don't know what to do with, so they just completely ignore it, or they get super fascinated with it and they embrace a lot of unhealthy nonsense in a genuine desire to better know and be equipped to face the future. But what they're choosing to take in is irrelevant at best and actually spiritually harmful at worst. So I hope you enjoy this discussion with Dr. Matthew Halstead. So we're here with Matthew Halstead and his new book, The End of the World As You Know It is coming out. It's coming. Has it been released yet or is it as of where we're recording? Yeah, it'll be released February the 7th. Okay, we're coming up very soon. It's going to be released. So Dojo viewers, you're getting a little preview of coming attractions. I am friends with some of the folks at Lexum Press, which publishes the book, and they sent me a copy last year. And I read it while I was at SBL buying a bunch of other books that I was going to read this year. And I was, I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I reached out to, I think I reached out to you through Facebook. I'm not sure. And said, Hey, love to have you on to talk about it. And you agreed. So Matthew Halstead is here. Just give Dojo viewers a quick intro, who you are, what you do, where you work, um, that kind of thing. And then we'll jump in and start talking about eschatology. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, let me just say thank you uh, for having me on the show. It's a privilege. It's an honor. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. A little bit about me. Uh, I, I am a professor at Eternity Bible College, and I've been teaching with them uh, on, in some capacity since 2016. So a good number of years now. And uh, it's, it's fun being on uh, faculty there. I also serve on the executive team and do a lot of admin sort of work. I teach uh, just a range of courses. I've taught a range of courses through the years, and um, I'm coming up. Let's see, this spring we'll be actually be doing Revelation this spring, mm -hmm. along with a, a, one of our prophets classes. So uh, we teach a I teach a class on the latter prophets. Is your Revelation class um, is it is it undergrad, seminary, grad? What level is it? It's all undergrad. Okay. Yeah, yeah okay. all undergrad. Mm -hmm. Well, who are so before we'll jump in and talk later, but I Revelation yeah. is one of I'm I'm mostly an Old Testament guy, but Revelation without a doubt is my favorite New Testament book to teach. Um, what are some things like as you're prepping to teach undergrad students Revelation? Mm -hmm. What do you wish more people knew when they start to study or read Revelation? Man, that's a loaded question. That's that's a great question. Um yeah, I think the thing that excites me the most about Revelation is that when you study Revelation, when you do a deep dive through 
that last book of the Bible. If you want to do it justice, you also have to do a lot of historical work. And so I think what I most look forward to when I teach this class or when I talk about Revelation is helping the people that I'm teaching to see that this is not a, how shall I say it, a theology book proper, but it was actually a living letter written to real Christians going through real problems who needed real encouragement. And so, as I mean, look, as soon as you say Revelation is a letter, is the minute you opened up, open up the, the, the next question, namely, okay, well, what was going on that precipitated and demanded that this letter be written? And what, what, what's behind the motive of the author and, you know, so forth and so on. And so that demands historical work on some level. Mm-hmm. And I have found just teaching the Bible in any capacity or teaching any part of the Bible, I should say. Um, I found that a lot of Christians don't actually, I mean, they know, but they don't, they don't know, you know, that, uh, that the, that it's a real, a uh, product of real people, right. And that, that, that there were stories there. And so it's always exciting to help the Bible come alive. And the Bible definitely comes alive when you, when you look into the historical background of what's going on in Revelation. So for example, you get into Roman empire, politics, cultural issues, you know, you just open up the door to a lot of things. And so just from my experience, you know, to see the light bulb go off where people are like, oh, wow. So that's why John was saying what he was saying, you know. So um, that's what I most look forward to. I love the Bible. I love looking into it and diving into it and teaching it. So um, Revelation Revelation is a, a pinnacle of sorts. It really is. It was my my probably my most formative uh, class in seminary 20 something years ago was that I still remember, like that I still regularly draw from was Sean McDonough's Revelation class. I, I had always enjoyed the book and I was not raised with a predis, uh, premillennial dispensational reading of Revelation. I mean, I sort of was growing up in the South in the Bible Belt, but I was never taught that as, as like, this is what we believe. It was always like, well, this is what some people believe. But, you know, I was kind of brought up with Bruce Metzger and breaking the code and that kind of approach to Revelation. And so when I got to seminary, I remember in uh, Sean McDonough's class just sitting and being like, the pieces falling into place. Oh, that historical background makes so much sense of this sign or this biblical background explains this weird symbol and and sort of connecting the dots without it being what it is in popular theology, which is sort of the traditional, uh, it's a roadmap to the future or the newspaper headlines in advance or, or any of those other just woeful misreadings of Revelation that the first readers would have had no idea what they were right. talking about. Oh, uh, right. well, we'll come back to Revelation because, like I said, it is definitely my favorite book. And a uh, quick plug for Disciple Dojo viewers, if you are interested in Revelation. So we have a course here at Disciple Dojo. Now, this is back before we were a nonprofit. We used to sell DVDs to churches to use as curriculum. It's all free here on the website. So I'll put a link to uh, our Revelation course here. Check it out. It's entirely free, downloadable workbooks free, and it is very much in line with a lot of what we're going to talk about with Matthew here today. And I want to start with a quote from your book. So I just plugged our course, but I want to plug yours again. This is coming out next month. And in the introduction, it was on page five, you had a great quote. Um, I'm just going to read the whole thing. You said, Today's speculative misapplications continue in the same vein. Sadly, the consequences have been dire, not to mention embarrassing. As Christians, we are called to be ambassadors of the King. But this calling is seriously undermined when we propagate false interpretations in front of an unbelieving world. When we buy into and spread the teachings of popular prophecy teachers whose predictions fail to pan out, the watching world takes note of our folly. When we share baseless end time speculations to our friends on social media, unbelievers may very well wonder whether they should listen to the other things we say. Why should they believe our good news when we in the same breath spread fake news? That was a great paragraph. I have an idea of the type of things you're talking about, but give a viewer some example, like, like put some, put some flesh on that. What are some things you've seen Christians do in the name of eschatological uh, teaching or prophecy that have seriously undermined the the good news. 
What, what did you have in mind in that discussion? You can be as, you can be as vague as you want, uh, as nice as you want, or you can be as straightforward as you want. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, yeah, you know, I just remember when I was a young, uh, Christian teenage years, you know, middle teenage years or so, and I was very serious about my faith and very serious about, uh, growing my relationship with God and becoming familiar with scripture and so forth. I would be you know, reading scripture every day, praying every day, that kind of thing. And naturally, when you're pursuing God, you um, um, you read a lot of other uh, Christian books and stuff. And so I remember being, when I was in that, that time, uh, surrounding myself with a lot of resources that um, were really thick and heavy. And I had no idea at the time that these probably weren't good resources, but they were really thick and heavy in eschatological speculation and definitely in fervor. Uh, from the things I was listening to on the radio, to the books that I was reading, to the people I would talk to, um, there, there was this, um, deep, deep anxiety about the future. Um, they probably wouldn't have said that they would have made the good Christian confession. So, you know, God's going to work it all out in the end, but watch out because it's coming, you know, and see, see, look what's happening on the news. Look what happened in the middle East. Oh my goodness. Did you hear the latest piece on, um, uh, CNN about, you know, you know, fill in the blank. And so I just remember a lot of times being absolutely terrified, you know, and um, and so through the years, what I, I, I had heard all sorts of different things that, uh, you know, the, the rapture was coming right around the corner. I'll just pick on the rapture for a little bit. Right. And uh, and then it was really interesting when I would hear people talk about the rapture because they spoke out so spoke, spoke about it with such certainty and they spoke about um, what follows the rapture, namely a seven year in their mind, seven year tribulation. And then during that time, A, B and C would happen. I mean, they had it mapped out like right. calendar mapped out. And over time, I, I began to just think, OK, well, where is that in the Bible? I mean, isn't that such a basic question that I never really thought to ask? But it's such an important question. Where is that in the Bible? And uh, when, you know, when you begin asking those questions to people, you begin to find out that they don't know where it's at in the Bible either. Right. And, and then that helps you figure out, oh, well, the reason they say that is because they read a book, whether it's a fictional book or it's a popular level prophecy teaching book about, you know, um, how the Antichrist is, uh, you know, growing up in Iraq or whatever, you know, whatever the book is. And um, and that's where they're getting their information. And so I just um, at that at that point, uh just began thinking through and then that le led to listening to other types of people through the years. Um, some of the some of the more interesting things that I had heard growing up, and I don't even remember where I first heard this, but but one thing I heard was that the beast, for example, was this like supercomputer in in Europe, and it had a way of tracking everything. Of course, all the mark of the beast stuff, the microchips in your in your forehead or in your hand, you know, there was always always this sort of speculation about those sorts of things. Yes. Um, what's what's really interesting though about all this is that. There were a million plus one prophecies and teachings on those sorts of topics. And what what's really interesting is how they just simply never panned out. I mean, they just never they never came to fruition. But but what was interesting is that by the time those uh, speculations petered out, the people were already on to the next speculation. Right. Yeah. They were already jumping forward to the next thing. And it just, you know, looking back, it just. It, it strikes me as just very unstable in many ways. And it's like, it, it's really shocking. Um, some of the weirdest stories I had heard back then, I mentioned the beast thing. Um, the, you know, there were, um, uh, actually, this was more recent, but it's pretty interesting. I think I, I originally heard this, maybe something Craig Keener had, had talked about in one of his talks. But there's there's actually a uh, uh, an organization, I, I, I maybe it's defunct now. It's been a while since I've been to their website. But actually, when I was on their website last, it, it seemed defunct. But anyway, uh, there was a website that that uh, said that they would take care of your pets. Like if you got yeah. rapture. Oh, yeah. You know, rapture they, pets. <laughs> yeah, the rapture pet thing. And <laughs> and um, and so the people, I guess, that ran it, uh, I don't I can't remember if they were Christians or not, but they had a, a whole Excel file, apparently, of non-Christians who were willing to take your pets. They, of course, they didn't believe that you would get raptured. But to make you feel better, right? you know, right. you could register your pets on this uh, file. And once the great vanishing happens, 
then this whole system would kick in and people would take care of your pets. Right. And in my book, I kind of joke about this, but I'm, I'm serious. Is that It's really funny how, you know, under that system, how Christians really need non-Christians to stick around and take care of our cultural mandate, take care of all the, the creation. <laughs> it was just right. really odd. But so, so you have those really extreme things. Now, that's a funny thing. I don't know. I don't know anybody who's actually fallen for that one. But, um, <laughs> but I have seen and I have heard through the decades Many people take these eschatological speculations and actually turn them into uh, political policy, right? Or turn them into the way they uh, conduct their finances and those sorts of things. And so we, you know, there's these, there are these funny sort of uh, rapture pet scenarios, but there are also very serious ones where this can impact people's well-being. And I remember, and I think this is in my book. I quote Michael Gorman. Uh, in one from one of his books, I think it's the book "Reading Revelation Responsibly." That yeah, Mormon book. Mm-hmm. yeah, a number of years ago, he actually talks about how, like, this is you know the the way you interpret Revelation can impact a person's health. I mean, it really can, and he's not you know exaggerating at all. It can actually impact a person's life, and it does. It does today, and um, so that's why I think this is an issue that we need to we need to get settled down on and and think deeply yeah. about. Oh, could not <clears throat> could not agree more. From day one, Disciple Dojo has we've always had a strong corrective focus on eschatology. And by corrective, what I mean is there's so much speculation, there's so much nonsense, there's so much anxiety inducing uh just that doom scrolling, uh the phenomenon, just that whole phenomenon that drives it is has permeated the church and the irony of ironies is eschatology was always intended to give god's people hope and to make people who were not in a right relationship with god know that hey things aren't always going to be this way and you will get yours in the end if you continue down this path there's there's a you know judgment and hope or two sides of the same coin when it came to the day of the lord and that's a lot of that's been lost um, or, or been clouded in the speculation and the the dispensational timeline charts and figuring. I mean, how, I'm I'm 45. How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? No, 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 no 39. Okay, so we're close to the same age. Do you are you mm-hmm. old enough to remember? Because I vividly remember um, uh, 88 reasons why Jesus will return in 88. Do you remember? I- yeah. Yeah. I, I was a little too young when it came out, but I do know what you're talking about. Yeah. I was 10. So that would have been about fourth or fifth grade when that happened. And I remember going home from school and somebody was like, yeah, the rapture is going to happen. You know, I think it was the day that it was supposed to happen. And I just remember thinking, that's okay. so silly. But I wonder, like, there was a little bit, you know, like a little bit of hesitation, like, well, maybe he has found something that, you know, my 10 year old mind didn't know, but, but I had known enough. My, my parents had done a good enough job, um, grounding me in the fact that no one knows the day or the hour. So as soon as somebody makes a prediction, you can confidently dismiss them. And, and it kept me from being led astray, but even as recently, what, four or five years ago, maybe five or six years ago, how camping was going around. And, uh, there's even a website, I think you can know.com or you can know.org or something like that. It just never dies. And the meanwhile, the watching world, like you say in this quote, the watching world looks on like, what are you guys doing? How many how many failed prophecies does it take for somebody to be a false prophet or or for a system to not work? How many adjustments to the system do you have to make before it to not work? Did you ever see did you ever watch Parks and Rec? Uh, no, I think I've seen one or two. Episodes. OK, there, there's a great I've mentioned it in a video on here on the channel before. There's a great episode where the. um there's, they do a parody of a cult, a local cult in Pawnee, Indiana, <laughs> called the, uh, the the reasonableness or something, something like that, to make them sound very reasonable. But they believe in that this lizard god is going to destroy the world, and they have a date, and so they do like a picnic at a local park, and and the joke of the episode is every year they schedule their picnic on that date, and then every year when it doesn't happen, they come back in, and the guy says, "Oh, I miscalculated." I think it's going to be, and it's next year on the date. So they're just like, you want us to reserve it for this year? Okay, we got it. It's a funny episode having to do with end time speculation, Mm. but it really reflects the approach that even some Christians take 
which is don't quit. Like if, if it's, if it didn't turn out right, instead of far be it from questioning the entire hermeneutic, let me just mm -hmm. fiddle with some dates and, oh, yeah. it was, it was, oh, it's not when Jerusalem was founded. It's when they, Israel retook Jerusalem. So it's not 1948, it's 1967. Ah, so therefore, you know, it just keeps getting bumped back and bumped back. And all the while mm -hmm. you just have Christians looking foolish. That's so true. I mean, in, in so many ways, I, I think that, um, you know, one, one thing that has really startled me, and I, I encourage people to um, to do this, is like when you go to your bookstore and you see the prophecy section, I mean, our local bookstore always has this huge prophecy section. Right. And when you go look at it, I mean, there's all it's there's always something new there, like depending on what's happened on the on the global news, you know, global right. events, there's always something new. And I remember when um, here in our country, the U.S., there was something big happening with Iran. And if I remember right, there was something about Iran on one of these prophecy book covers, you know, it's just the, these things cycle in and out. What's fascinating to me is, and I encourage people to do this, is like go to those uh, book stands and flip through the books and, and see how much research was done to put those together. Or is it all based on speculation? Because right. most of the time, right, uh, these, these things are just the, existing in the author's mind and they're making things up as they go or you know, and I'm like, well, give me a footnote, like, show me where I can go check your work, you know, and mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to question a, you know, a person's sincerity or anything of that sort. Uh, but I, I also, I, I also think that that whole cottage industry needs to be challenged to, um, you know, show us the work, you know, remember in math and grammar school, like you had, you couldn't just give the answer, right? right. You had to show right. the work. Yeah. And so I want to see the work. I want to see why you get to that position. And in my opinion, I mean, when it comes to eschatology and people who read my book will see this is that I, I say this, there's a lot we can't know. There, there are a range of options on some of these things. So I'm not suggesting that Matt Halstead has figured it out. I have not figured it out. Mm -hmm. I don't have all the answers. But all the same, when it, you know, when it comes to our discussions about eschatology, when it comes to writing books about eschatology, we really need to show the work because we need to understand that our readers will make life decisions based upon what's being said. So I just encourage everybody, go to those go to those book stands, open up those books and ask the question, where is he or she getting this from? If yeah. there's not a note, footnote or a source that you can go look at it, hold it carefully, hold that view carefully because um, you need to be able to check the work. Yeah, oh, absolutely. This actually segues the other quote I wanted to read from your intro. This is on page 11. You said, mm -hmm. I've grown dismayed at how little the work of scholars has made its way into the church, and I've been profoundly discouraged by how much misguided teaching has made its way in. And I think those are, and the, you make the case that those are the same, those are, it's the same phenomenon. You have, because there's such little solid biblical scholarship that trickles down to the average person in the pews, that therefore there's this hunger for theology, for eschatology, for biblical studies, there's a hunger for it that's not being fed by solid biblical scholarship. So what, when you don't have a good meal to eat, you eat junk food. And when it comes to eschatology, it's a whole, like you said, it is a cottage industry of eschatological junk food that churches, people in churches are, are just cramming into their mouths because there's a genuine hunger. There's a genuine hunger for knowing that God is in control of the future and that things are not outside of his domain. And when we see things in the news, when we start to get anxious and we start to wonder, I mean, we all do that. We, I, I, can only, I can only handle Twitter in about 10 minute chunks at most before I have to just like, okay, this is, I got to get off. This is nonsense. All it is is arguing, fighting or doom, doom and gloom. Yeah. What do you, you know, scripture, ha eschatology has so much to say to that. And mm -hmm. eschatology matters. It's, it's part of, it'll affect your, how you view the end affects how you view the beginning, how you view the middle, you know, how you view every aspect of theology. It's like a web. It's all interconnected. And one bad eschatological uh, decision can filter into all other areas of how we view the world. I mean, people vote based on their eschatology. They, That's they, right. they do. like, I think Michael Gorman has done a great job in reading Revelation responsibly. David De Silva has done a good job. 
even okay. outside of the church, um, Steve Mearsheimer and John Walt's book, The Israel Lobby, there's a whole chapter about how Reagan's eschatology was the basis of his foreign policy, which mm -hmm. was the basis of a lot of American foreign policy to Israel. And that has ramifications for what's going on right now in Gaza. Decisions are being made based on an eschatological view put onto a modern conflict. And, and so it's, Man, it's just so, so, so important. Who have been some of the most, like you said, you, you want people to check their sources, you know, yeah. show your work. So show your work for us in terms of who have been some influential voices in your own life, uh, whether you agree or disagree, it doesn't matter. Just who has helped shape uh, Matt Halstead's eschatology? That's a great question. Um, yeah, there's a range of people. It's the people that you mentioned, of course, at the top, Michael Gorman. David De Silva. I highly recommend everybody check out their books. Uh, Gorman's got, you know, his reading revelation responsibly. De Silva has uh, a little book called Unholy Allegiances. He's, he has a, an academic book called Discovering Revelation, which is phenomenal. I use that in my revelation class. Actually, I actually use both of those in my revelation class. Um, yeah, Nelson Crabill, he's got a book called Apocalypse and Allegiance. That's a really, really challenging book. It's a good book everybody should own. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, my uh, my friend Alan Bandy, he's uh, he's written he's he's a scholar of Revelation. He's got some good stuff, and uh, he's uh, yeah. Highly recommend everybody check out his stuff. Um, there's also uh, Craig Keener. You know, uh, I don't know if folks are familiar with Craig Keener's Revelation commentary. It's in the NIV Application Commentary series. Um, it's a great resource, man. Like it's it's phenomenal. Uh, you know, he's he's very well attuned to the ancient sources, the Greco-Roman world. That's oh, yeah. sort of his nobody knows his it more thing. than Keener. That's his yeah, for sure. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think every Christian should own his commentary. Um, and it's easy to read. There's always this application for it. That's part of that series, mm -hmm. but it's not to the expense of um of shortcutting the the homework, right? I mean, it's all there. Yeah. So yeah, Craig has been um, just a great resource too. So so I, I think all of those would be probably the first the first list I would give to people to read up on and um, and and to help you get a, a grasp of Revelation. Of course, there are those great commentaries, um, you know, um, Bill's commentary, for example, and you know others. So. Um, but um, but in terms of something that folks could just bite off and eat and, you know, exactly. check out definitely Gorman's book and De Silva and Kirk, you know, all those that I mentioned. Yeah. And, and you mentioned Beale's commentary, which is super intimidating and you have to know Greek to even really be able to use it. But I believe that's there's definitely a, the next list. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I believe there's a shorter version, though. I believe that there's a condensed version of Beale's commentary. And I know there's one of Craig Kester's comment to Craig Kessler has a shorter revelation in That's the end of all too. things, but his big work on revelation is in, I think, anchor Bible. Um, so if, yeah, if your right. viewers that are intimate, you know, like I haven't been to seminary, I don't know Greek, I, you know, the big things are, I, I'm not at that level yet. Um, sure. There's usually condensed popular level versions. They just aren't as they're not. What's frustrating to me is they're not marketed dishonestly the way a lot of right. prophecy stuff is. I when right. when I see the word prophecy expert on a author bio, I immediately <laughs> know this is going to be a lot of nonsense because mm -hmm. no true eschatological scholar, no true revelation expert calls themselves that. That's one of the hallmarks right. of a huckster. <laughs> and so I, yeah. just little things like that if you you don't want to say, "Hey, guys, start marketing your stuff more sensationalistically so more people will read it." But there's a little part of me that does. <laughs> I confess, there's a little part of me that does. It's like, hey, those you got to reach the people who are buying things with countdown in the title, or yeah. you know, <laughs> anything with apocalypse in the title, anything like that. Right. It's going to yeah. pique interest of certain people and mm -hmm. Armageddon. Uh, and there's good yeah. stuff out there on these topics. It's just not. I'm, I'm hoping. I'm hoping your book helps move the needle. A little bit, honestly, in Disciple Dojo, I'm going to be, uh, I've said when I posted on Instagram, I said, if I, if I, somebody's like, you know, why haven't you written on eschatology? And I have a little, I mean, Disciple Dojo, I've got a little self-published, it's called You Want to Be Left Behind, um, but it's just a collection of like little chapterettes. But after somebody asked me and I was like, actually, Matt Halstead's 
pretty much written the book that I would, if I were going to write a book, he, I wouldn't have much to add to it, which is rare when I come across a book that, that that's the case, but it really is. And, and so Disciple Dojo, I would absolutely encourage viewers. I'm not getting paid for this. Alexa's not giving me anything. <laughs> Matt's not giving me a kickback. When it, when his book comes out, definitely get it and read it. Um, it's going to really challenge a lot, especially if you come up in the thief in the night, left behind late great planet earth, uh, uh, Kirk Cameron rapture movies, Nicholas Cage rapture movies. If you've come <laughs> up in that subculture of evangelicalism, then Matt's book is exactly what you need to be reading. Not because he's right. And, and I like what you said, not saying you have the answers. You just know the questions we should be asking that a lot of the popular eschatology authors will just like, Oh no, don't, don't ask about that. Just trust what I'm telling you. Cause I've got it figured out. And uh, it just, it's headache inducing. Thank you for the kind words. I, 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 you know, it's interesting because this whole book and I'm, I'm being honest here, like it started with an iPhone uh, note memo. <laughs> uh -huh. Like I was jotting down things because I had been seeing on social media, like all this stuff that's being said about end times. This was around 2020. Lots of uh, eschatological speculation going on in that year. And um, my wife kept nudging me, hey, you need to like, you, you should comment on this. You should say something. I don't know if I want to get into that. She's like, no, you definitely should. You should do it. So I just typed something up on my iPhone uh -huh. and posted it out there. That led to an article being published. Somebody saw it and wanted to publish it. And that led that article led to another article and those articles led to a book. So it was just, it was all started with an iPhone and, um, in, in a little notepad, but the, the, the point was to help people. I, mm -hmm. I, I genuinely don't want people to be afraid. That's the, why the subtitle is what it is. You know, why it's good news. Eschatology is gospel. Yes. It's, it's the good news. And, and like you said earlier, you know, depending on the constitution of your heart, are you going to be on board with the good news? That will determine whether or not you participate in the goodness mm -hmm. of God's um, new creation. But but I think, like, at the end of the day, I, I, I genuinely would just want to help people. I, I don't have all the answers. But, um, I, you know, if we can come alongside each other and ask the right questions, I think we're one step closer to getting to the truth of the matter. Yeah, absolutely. I I'm going to do a second shameless plug because we're talking eschatology. And like I said, Disciple Dojo, we've been focused on that for a long time. But your book does very similar to what our podcast series does. So we have a podcast series called Apocalypse Now, question mark, what the Bible teaches about the end times. This was the, one of the, I mean, this is before we even had video. So it's audio only. This is the old CD copies. This is on our podcast list now. But the whole point of that series that I taught, and I taught it in a local church, like ah, it must have been 12 years ago by now, 10 or 12 years ago, was exactly what you're talking about. It was people have real questions and they have real concerns and they're being fed a bunch of conflicting at times messages. So how do, how do we give them the hope? And it was N.T. Wright's book, Surprised by Hope, had just recently come out. So we used that and Michael Gorman's Reading Revelation Responsibly as sort of the two textbooks for the course. But we walked through the, the the structure of that podcast series was, okay, here are the historic Christian views. Like we mapped out, this is what premillennialism is, dispensational premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennialism. Then once we had that, the lay of the land and kind of each session was, hey, let me just present it how an, a, a proponent of that view would present it. Then once people kind of had their minds around, okay, these are the things that drive people's readings of scripture. Then we walked through the passages. We, we just, eschatology and Torah, eschatology and prophets, eschatology and the gospels, eschatology and Paul. And it, and, and it, and never, you know, I never was like, and this is the view I hold, you know, it was just like, you know, the views, you see the texts, make your own conclusions, but, but you're doing it with a, a foundation and you do similarly in your book. Your book isn't structured canonically, it's structured topically. So you take the topics of eschatology and you say, okay, let's just bring to bear some biblical foundations on the mark of the beast or the, the tribulation or, you know, whatever it is. 
So I would like, I'd love for, for the rest of our time to just give viewers, you to give viewers a little bit of a foretaste. And I throw out a topic that you've written on in the book and you just, just a little elevator pitch spiel about like either what you think about it or what you think the type of questions we should be asking about it or where you think people may have missed some things on that topic. So does that sound good? Sounds great. Yeah. All right. You're on the eschatological hot seat. Uh, so let's start in times or the last days. Are we, when, when somebody says, um, Dr. Hossa, are we in the last days? How do you answer that question? Man, it's an excellent question. It's on everybody's minds. I have a chapter called, Are We Living in the End Times? And um, it's, essentially, I, I would I would encourage people to um, to go back through the New Testament and and ask the question, did the New Testament authors think they were living in the time of the end? Um, there are a number of texts that I, I, I suspect we just gloss over, read over really uh, blandly um, without even considering what's actually being said. So, for example, there are passages uh, in, in like uh, Paul's letters to Timothy, to Hebrews that speak of the latter times, the end times. And those are very much contextualized to those local times of the first century. And we would never really notice that, uh, you know, I'm thinking, for example, of Hebrews chapter one, you know, in, in, in former days, previous ways, God has spoken to us through the prophets, but in these latter days, he's spoken to us through his son, right? And so um, you also have in Acts chapter two, where, um, uh, you know, the, the idea of the end days uh, are, is used to, to refer to an event that's happening in the first century. So when I would just encourage people to go back, like, like take all the, all of your assumptions and I suspect a lot of people, this is the popular view, the assumption is that the end times just means that era right before the final events, right? And and just take that assumption, recognize that it is an assumption, right? It, it, you know, we need to, we need to uh, practice recognizing um, when we have blurred the line between our assumptions and the text itself, because those are yes. different things. Oh, yes. And preach, our, preach. Our, yeah, yeah, our assumptions, <laughs> you know, if you're, and here's the thing. That begins by recognizing that you do have assumptions, because if you don't recognize that you bring to the text your own presuppositions, your assumptions, then what you'll end up doing is, because you've not recognized them, you'll end up reading out of the text what you put into the text. It's a unilateral reading such that at that point, the text can never teach you anything because it's just your voice in the text, right? Yeah. And so, so I just remind people, like, you have assumptions. Okay, so let's take this as an assumption. Now, it might be a right assumption, it might be a biblical assumption, or it might be a non-biblical assumption, namely the assumption that the end times is that era right before the final events. Okay, take that assumption, test it. Go back to scripture, find all the passages that deal with the times of the end, or end times, latter times, however you want to phrase it, because there are different ways it's phrased, and, and just ask yourself, what did the New Testament writers think? I think that that um, what readers will end up doing is recognizing that this is a multi-layered reality. That, yeah, I'm content with saying that the end times has something to do with the final events and the times leading up to that. But if you relegate it there, you're not going to make sense of much of the New Testament. There are passages in the New Testament that speak of the end times as also the first century, <laughs> right? So, so we need to do something with that data. That's data. And we need to come back to our assumptions that we've set on the table here. And we need to say, okay, what part of our assumptions need tweaking? I understand that that is a, uh, I think I call it a risky move. It's a, it's tough, you know, to question your assumptions, but we are disciples, right? Uh, disciple jo dojo, right? Yeah, we are absolutely. disciples, which means we have discipline. We need to exercise hermeneutical discipline uh, such that we're not, such that we are willing to test our assumptions. So yeah, the end times, I think it's a multi-layered reality. And I think it's a. I think we do that phrase a lot of in, injustice, biblically speaking, when we relegate it to just the final events. Beautiful answer, and I I'm going to make two points on your answer. Piggyback one on the whole concept of being disciples and struggling and exposing our preconceptions to rigorous interaction. I mean, disciple like like what I teach jujitsu. One of the things that makes jujitsu an effective martial art 
is that it you are pressure tested every class. You don't just memorize a pattern and work with a partner who's like, okay, I'll punch here and then you block here and then yay, we go home. You have to learn a technique and then you have to do it against somebody who's going to try to stop you from doing it. And, and in jujitsu, that's called rolling or sparring. But that's what makes you better. I can teach a self-defense seminar, show somebody 20 moves, and I guarantee you nobody in that class will know how to do those moves for a long time because it takes that pressure testing, that resisting opponent. And theology, I think it's the same way. You have to, when you make a theological claim, you say, okay, let's express let's let's expose this to pressure testing let's spar with this a little bit you think the last days are something that are on the horizon okay how did peter talk about the last days when he stood up at pentecost what did he say but you know like that kind of it's it's absolutely a hundred percent spot on the second thing i want to say is actually i want to ask you a question because i won't do this with all of these sections but one of the things I noted, this was page 26 of your book, you're talking about Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. And you made a connection that I'd never made before. And I thought it was really interesting. You said, um, uh, when Paul talks about Christians belonging to the day, that phrase, and I've just always thought of that as day, as in they've woken up, they're no longer asleep, it, just a general metaphor. You said, but there's another aspect we need to consider too. When Paul says Christians belong to the day, He's also talking about the coming day of the Lord. And I've never seen that connection, but it seems very plausible. On a scale of one to 10, how confident would you be that that is an actual, what, that that is what Paul's actually referencing, alluding to versus it's a plausible connection versus, well, you know, I, this just seems to make sense. Like, I'm just, I wanted to ask you, person to person about that because that's a connection how how solid are you on that connection yeah I, i'm pretty solid on it, it uh, you know i'm always willing to revise something if i've if i've oh, if inked up something that, that ends up being wrong but um yeah i i uh, i'm trying to remember exactly what, uh that whole text and that yeah i yeah to give you a number, I, I I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm highly confident that that's a good connection to make. Um, the, 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 to, the, for the, viewers the, who haven't read yeah. it yet, um, it's uh, when Paul says we belong to the day, and mm -hmm. that you know I just typically thought that was a general metaphor. But you make the connection: we belong to the yeah. day. Capitalize that D because he's talking about the mm -hmm. day of the Lord, which would fit with what the whole correspondence to the Thessalonians in large part yeah. revolves around, which is the day of the Lord. Have we missed it? Have we missed the day of the Lord? So I've never seen that connection. That's why I read books yeah, and, to learn new things. Yeah, and I, I think it's plausible that this is definitely going through, and, and, and I'm confident even that something like this would be going through Paul's mind because, um, you know, this, you know, when we talk about Jesus, and I, I talk about this in the book, is that you know, Jesus is not just a player in the end times. Like, he is, in a sense, the end, right? Right. And it's the day of the Lord, not just meaning that, uh, you know, that's a day that the Lord does something, but it's the day of the Lord in the sense this is when he manifests himself. This is a day when he shows up big time. So, um, when Scripture talks about, I'm thinking here of Romans 8, that as Christians, we are longing for that final day whenever we are made new, our bodies are redeemed, you know, at the great resurrection. And um, we, we, we are longing, we're pressing forward to that day. And so we belong to that. We've been given the promises of God that, um, that uh, you know, as we stay faithful to him and loyal to him, we will be participants of that day. And that day is not only a day of the Lord, but it's also a day of the Lord's people. So I think there is an intimate connection there mm -hmm. that I think is worth exploring. I, it definitely is. And, and you didn't, you don't, you don't spend a lot of time on it. It's almost like an aside comment. It was just at the end, in the middle of one paragraph and then you move on to other things. But it was so, it was just interesting to me. I was like one of those, Hey, that's makes a lot of sense of a lot of things he's saying. If he's saying we're people of the day, not in a general metaphorical sense of we're not walking in darkness, we're in the light. Well, yeah, right, right. but it's the very specific, the light of the day of the Lord, and it's already mm -hmm. begun, and we are walking in that light. I mean, it just, it ties together a lot of themes about day and light, and biblically, the, biblical theologically, it was a really interesting point that I got out of it, um, and I wanted to just touch on it. But I don't want to spend a ton of time. I want, I want viewers to read the book and, and see what they think. 
I tell us about moving on from that topic. Um, let's get into Revelation just a little bit. When you teach on Revelation or, or somebody's saying, you know, hey, I'm thinking about doing a Revelation study. What is maybe, you don't have to, I wouldn't say what is your number one thing you tell them, but maybe like you're just a sampling of things that you say, okay, as you're going to study Revelation, keep these things in mind. Now we, we have a superhero seminary video, so I'm surrounded by our esteemed faculty of superhero seminary. That's <laughs> what these action figures are for. And uh, Professor Strange, Dr. Stephen Strange, actually has a video here on the channel of his tips for reading the strange book of Revelation. What would be some of your tips to, to mm -hmm. new re brand new readers that want to get into Revelation? Sure. Give, mm -hmm. give us some tips. Yeah, I think, I think there are three things to keep in mind when you're reading Revelation. Uh, the first thing is to remember that, um, that the book of Revelation is not a book. <laughs> like, it's not a theological book. It's not some sort of uh, eschatological book, uh, you know, alone it necessarily uh, has a lot to do with eschatology, but that's uh, it's not a book in that sense. At the end of the day, it's a letter. And I think that most people find that surprising. Like, this is a letter. And as I said earlier, that opens up a whole can of worms because you need to start asking yourself, Okay, if this is a letter, what's the context of the letter? What's the situation? What are the circumstances? What's the unspoken language here that is, doesn't come across explicitly? So if we're talking about letter, we can presume some sort of personal correspondence, uh, I mean, personal relationship here. John seems to know these people, and these people seem to know John at least enough to read some of his stuff. And um, anytime you have a relationship like that, there's going to be unspoken uh, well, there's there, there's going to be a lot of shared uh, concepts with shared meaning, in them, right? So, so um, if you know you and I are talking about um, a big city in the Northeast United States, um, I can just simply refer to the Big Apple and go on, right? right? I I can say that, and so there's a shared meaning there that is not explicit, namely that the Big Apple equals New York City, right? Right. And so I suspect a lot of that can happen there too, and and. Lo and behold, I actually think it does. So when you get into the thicker portions of Revelation, you start having language and concepts and symbols like beast. You have um, the number seven that um, is associated with seven mountains. You have, you know, and, and right there, I mean, Rome, they're, they're, you're, you're no doubt talking about Rome because Rome is known as the city on the seven uh, mountains or hills. There was a whole feast associated with this and, you know, yada, yada, yada. So you got to know it's a letter because then it, it, it that shows you what doors you need to open up and explore. And that's that's a fun journey to go down. So you got to know it's a letter. And number two, um, you you need to know that um, it's a prophecy. It calls itself a prophecy. And but you need to understand what a prophecy is. And this is where I think a lot of things get messed up is because a lot of Christians think prophecy or they equate prophecy with something like Nostradamus or a crystal ball that it's all about predicting the future. And in my book, I talk about how, yeah, there's a predictive element sometimes with prophecy, but you can't reduce prophecy, at least biblical prophecy, down to just prediction. And I give a num numerous examples about this, and I talk a lot about it, is that prophecy, at the end of the day, is, um, while it can, it can certainly include predictive elements, often does, it's about exhortation. It's about sharing God's pointed message for you in this certain circumstance such that you need to listen to it and then obey it. Um, and so, so that's actually an interesting point to make too with Revelation, because throughout Revelation, there are, you know, uh, phrases and words like, you know, obey this or, you know, keep the words of this prophecy, that kind of stuff. Well, that makes sense because it's what a prophecy is. But notice what we've done there. If, if this is a letter to the first century and he's telling them to keep these words, then that assumes what? It assumes that they have to understand it, that they have to be able to understand it, right? This is a point that Craig Keener brings up often, is that um, that it has to be um, a, a text that would not have made them feel lost, right? That it would have been at home with them. And so it might be strange to us, but don't assume, another assumption, don't assume that what's strange to you in the 21st century Western world, say, is going to be strange to someone first century uh, in the in the in the Middle East, right? Uh, or actually in Turkey, modern day Turkey, Asia Minor. So, um, so may, maybe what's strange to you isn't strange to them. May, maybe a thousand years from now, people think it's just super strange and odd that we would call New York City the Big Apple, right? right. 
Like, what's up with that? Well, it's not strange to us. Um, and so there's a distance, time distance that we need to, to account for in these certain conversations. So you got to know it's a letter. You got to know it's a prophecy. You also need to know it's an apocalypse. Um, apocalyptic literature, um, you know, if we could speak of this body of literature as an apocalyptic uh, genre, um, that, that's something that, that Revelation would be. Uh, certainly, an apocalyptic has a number of um, noted um, characteristics, one of which is you're speaking in symbols. Um, there's a lot of symbolic language here. It's not meant to be taken woodenly in the sense that we take, uh, you know, certain things woodenly. Um, that there's symbolic elements here, and that has to be accounted, uh, accounted for as well. So, um, I, you know, and I, I think it was um, Gorman and, and maybe um, uh, Nels, uh, Crable, uh, Nelson Crable, they talk about how um, Revelation is like a political cartoon, right? That just like in politics, uh, even in our own country in the U.S., that, you know, sometimes even today we still have political cartoons where you you depict your political opponent in certain exaggerated forms and ways to communicate some truth, right? Yeah. Or what you claim to be true. And, and I think something like that is going on here, too, is that there's a reason beast image, imagery is used. There's Old Testament reasons for that. And there are, I think, um, first century Greco-Roman reasons for that as well. So, yeah, that's a that's a mouthful. But three things you got to know. It's a letter, prophecy, and that's an apocalyptic uh, um, letter as well. So all of those three combine. And I... You know, we could add a fourth that it's a political sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a what um, uh, these writers call it, Gorman, I believe, is um, calls it. The, there's a theopolitical context, right, right. Uh, to the letter too. So, um, and most so, apocalypses, yeah. most apocalypses had the uh, theo, uh, you know, a, a political aspect to them, or at least were written addressing worldly issues involving rulers and powers and principalities. And so sure. it, it fits right into your third point there that, yeah, yeah. that's what apocalypses are meant to unveil, uh, to, yeah. to reveal, right. literally. Right. And, and this is actually a point that David DeSilva mentions in one of his books. Um, he says that, you know, revelation doesn't, doesn't need a key to unlock it, but rather revelation is the key to unlock reality. Mm-hmm. And that's how John, the first century uh, recipients of this letter, would have understood that like, this is meant to be something that unlocks the world for them, that helps them to see the world. So they're no longer seeing Rome or Caesar or the empire. Um, what they're seeing is the dragon who empowers the empire to do very beastly sorts of things, right? Yeah. And so so John's trying to say, look, you guys feel like you're beat up. You're following the lamb who was slain and you're fighting against the beast. But let me tell you a story. One day, the beast and the lamb are going to square off. And guess what? The lamb wins. You would think it's the monster who beats the lamb that was slain. But actually, the story goes that the lamb who was slain wins, and all those who cling to the lamb will be uh, rescued as well. Yeah. That, and that's the story. That, that's to show them, hey, this is what reality really is. Don't yes. see Rome, see the dragon. Yes. To, to peek behind the curtain. And, and yes. this is what it... There's viewers that have, have watched some of... We have a Revelation playlist here on the channel that has not, not our course on the book, but that just different little videos that give some background and and a lot of what Matt's saying, if you want to dig a little further and you don't want to wait until his book comes out, um, poke around on that playlist here on the channel. But the political cartoon aspect, to me, that's the best way to intuitively understand what an apocalypse is, is not that they're the same, but that they are doing the same thing, which is how do I communicate subversively and at times antagonistically and making points in a way that's symbolic and easy to grasp for people who know the language. You mentioned Big Apple. That's a great mm-hmm. point. I, I imagine, imagine a thousand years from now, somebody picking up an American newspaper or, you know, scrolling a, a archive of a website and they see a picture of like this guy with crazy blonde flipped up hair and little tiny hands and a pouty face and there, well, we would know, okay, that, oh, that's Trump. That's, this is how Trump is depicted in a lot of political cartoons right now. Well, why? Well, because there's jokes about his hair. Uh, why are his hands a little? Because there was a thing he said about having big hands and small hands is, you know, sort of a shot at his uh, image of virility. And so political artists, if they want to poke at somebody who presents himself as strong and powerful, one of the ways they'll just draw him with little tiny hands. It's such a specific and odd 
thing, but it has meaning that we just like intuitively would pick up on. A thousand years from now, they may have no idea. They may not even know why is a donkey and an elephant fighting each other and and yeah. what who is this guy with the the top hat that has the stars and stripes on it? Who what, was this a real? Did the Americans believe that there was a fictional Uncle Sam? That you know, it's like when you start asking those kind of questions, it puts you into the I think the right mindset to start asking questions about the beast, the dragon, ten horns, seven heads. Uh, you you start to realize, oh, this may not be something I have to decode as much as this is describing something that everybody in Asia Minor mm-hmm. certainly knew about. And they did. Yeah. So I, I, go ahead, because yeah, I'm going to ask sure. you about that beast in just a second. But if you want to pick up on anything before we move on. No, no, I just wanted to say, yeah, that was a really good way to put it. And, and you know, if we go with that a thousand years from now and, and people are looking at these images of a donkey and an elephant fighting or something, well, if they want to understand that, they need to do homework. They're going to have to do a little yes. extra homework. And so that's what I would point out to people. Say so you got to do the background work because that's yes. going to help you understand the, these images. I went to, we'll get off this in a second, I just, I promise, but it's such a vivid illustration. I, I go to India a lot of years and visit with friends over there and do some Bible uh, teaching. And one year I went, I was teaching on Revelation. And so I asked my uh, liaison, there was a newspaper in the car and I was looking through it and I saw a political cartoon and I had no idea what it meant. It was a little guy holding a monkey's tail over the fire. And the monkey was saying something and the guy was saying something and there was a label on the fire. And I was like, I don't know what this is about. So I gave it to our guy. I said, tell me what this is. Tell, tell me what this means. And he read it. <laughs> okay. You know, like he picked up on it immediately. And so I, you know, asking and, and he told me, well, this is based on a Hindu folk tale about this certain monkey king and this certain bad guy. But the bad guy has been made to look like the prime minister. And uh, the little wording on the fire says fuel rate increase because the prime minister had raised the price of fuel and the voters were... It was just this whole thing, but he immediately picked up on it. Mm -hmm. I had no clue. I had to learn the language, learn about the language, the historical background, like the political situation and the mythological background uh, or cultural background. And, but once I did, I was like, oh, okay, that's a clever political cartoon. I get it. It makes sense. So not having that background, you will get you, you'll, what is it? Who, Who made the phrase I've, John saw some strange visions, but none as strange as his own interpreters. Um, yeah, there was a couple, I think, uh, Chesterton. And it sounds Piper Chestertonian. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. It's so true. So one of those symbols that fascinates people, even non-Christians, is the Mark of the Beast, 666. Yeah. I mean, every 80s hair metal band had a song probably <laughs> dealing with 666. Yeah. Can people unknowingly take the mark of the beast? Do we need to be watching out for credit card chips or COVID vaccines or or any of these other things because they're the mark of the beast? Not saying we just need to accept everything, but specifically, are these things that people start to get nervous about, could they be the mark of the beast? Could we unknowingly take the mark of the beast? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it's funny when you look back on just, just even the past few decades here, you know, the mark of the beast has kind of undergone numerous trans transformations. So at one point, it would be social security cards or social security numbers. Um, it might be microchips. It might be, um, you know, something to do with a computer in, in Belgium and in Europe that I was talking about earlier. Uh, more recently, you know, it's been uh, something that you would put in a syringe, you know, something to do with a vaccine. Mm-hmm. Um, it used to be barcodes. I don't really hear anybody talking about barcodes right. there's a well-known <laughs> there's a well-known uh uh, uh a megachurch pastor who uh, in, in one of his commentaries mentions that it could be a barcode you know and um that was i don't know written 15 20 years ago i don't even remember but it is i just don't hear that much anymore so we've kind of moved on and as technology sort of grows um our speculations about the mark kind of grow with it right and so um it kind of goes back to these this idea that when one thing doesn't pan out, we're constantly searching for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Um, what's interesting about you know all of these modern day technologies, uh, whether barcode or syringes or whatever, um, w- one thing that's really interesting is we need to stop and ask a question, namely, would the first century recipients of Revelation have even picked up on this? Right? Would they even have <laughs> yeah. had a concept of of a vaccine? Did they even know what DNA was? Did they know how you know? 
you know, they certainly couldn't have known some of these things like barcodes and things like that. And so the reason I ask that is because, you know, going back to one of our assumptions about Revelation being a letter is that, um, uh, you know, it, it needed to have been under, understandable to them in order for them to obey it. So, like, if he's warning, if John is warning the um, the Christians of Asia, uh, you know, about the mark of the beast, you know, if it follows that he would want them to stay away from it, to obey his teaching on this. And it also follows, therefore, that they... Um, they would need to know a little bit about what what it is they need to avoid. Yeah. Oh, we need to avoid a barcode. <laughs> well, that's good because that's like super easy, dude. Because that's two thousand years down the road. Right, right. Well, <laughs> so 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 I'm just curious, just as an observation, is is whether or not these speculations would pass the test that we've just given it, right? Um, so what I suspect that we need to do is we need to um, uh, we need to come up with a way of understanding Revelation's Mark of the Beast. That would have been applicable to them. And as a confessional uh, biblical scholar myself, like I, I believe the things that I write about, right? So it's not just an academic exercise. These are academic exercises for me, but it's, but they're, you know, I'm a confessional scholar, like I, I'm a Christian. And, um, and so therefore I also think the Bible, it has authority, you know, and it has something to say to me today. It'll have something to say to my kids when they grow up and even today and, and their kids and so forth down the line. And so I need a way of making sense of the mark of the beast that is timeless, that speaks some sort of timeless truth. And um, so, you know, I suspect that what's going on here with the mark of the beast definitely had a first century, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's the word? Uh, it had a first century referent. I think there was something there that would have made sense of that. And I've come up with a few possibilities uh, you know, I'm not certain about any one of them, but I'm highly confident in all of them. And so it's just some options there doing the best work that maybe a historian could do is coming up with some options. But those options need to be um, flexible enough to be flushed out into the modern day world as well. So, for example, I've come up with some options, one of which is that the Mark of the Beast probably has something to do with uh, definitely, definitely has something to do with like the local economies. I think that's clear from Revelation 13, uh, the buying and the selling sort of thing. Um, we know uh, from historical data and historical research that the, you know trade guilds, kind of like a trade union, you, you might say, were very important. We know, for example, that in Thyatira, one of the cities of Revelation, it was known for its trade guilds, and so um, these trade guilds, moreover, would have had. Um, uh, you know, sort of like official, uh, you know, official membership sort of rules, right? Or maybe even some unspoken membership rules. Namely, um, if you're going to participate, you need to be willing to offer up sacrifice to the patron deities. Um, we do know uh, that that with the imperial cult, the worship of Caesar, that was a very big thing in Asia in the first century. And we do know that there were crossovers with um, these trade guilds and the imperial cult. I, I can't remember the source off the top of my head, but there was one, uh, maybe an inscription, I think it was, where um, the the president of a trade guild was also uh, some sort of functionary in an imperial temple where Caesar was worshipped. And so, so there was some crossover in the leadership there. And all to say, if you're a member of a trade guild, you probably um, needed to, in order to maintain your membership, um, pay homage to Caesar, uh, venerate him, worship him, along with the local deities or whoever, whatever patron deity was part of that tree guild. Well, if you're a Christian who believes Jesus is Lord, you can't do that, right? Um, we do know uh, from the writings of Pliny, for example, uh, that in that general vicinity, that general area, that Christians were, um, you know, sometimes when they were found out, arrested and whatnot, that um, uh, they were uh, tested, their, their loyalty to Caesar, by making them worship the image of Caesar. And you could read this in Pliny's writings um, in his letters to Trajan. And so, for example, you have those sorts of things. And, and, and when you read Revelation, you, you begin to see this sort of nexus of connections where the mark of the beast is associated with the worship of the image of the beast, right? And you have that little connection. Well, we, we have historical data where, um, uh, you know, Caesar's images were worshipped. And we also have historical data. This is all in the book. Um, there was an article, a peer-reviewed article by Mark Wilson, I quote him in this, is that um, we have as in our historical uh, data that um, the beast, the language of beast was used to refer to Nero and Domitian in, in a few elements. And so, so here we have, we've developed these connections where 
the Caesar's images were worshipped, and, and that was connected to a local economy. And the language of beast uh, was associated with uh, the Caesars, a couple of them at least. And when you put them all together and you come to Revelation, and you, with that background knowledge in, in mind, you say, my goodness, some of these are just highly coincidental, right? And so can I say for certain that all of that is the mark of the beast? Uh, yeah, I'm not certain about a lot of things, but I, I, I gauge uh, this by uh, levels of confidence. And I'm highly confident that something like this was the case, that that if yeah, I was a first century Christian living in Asia, when he's talking about the mark of the beast in these sorts of ways, tying them to the economy, tying them to the images of Caesar, of, of the beast and so forth, I'm immediately going to think image of Caesar probably or something to that effect. Um, and so uh, that's that's something that's very important. Now, what modern Christians would do, and, and by the way, let me just put a note here is there's a lot more to everything I just said in the book. So you need to go read those chapters that I talk about the beast. There's just a ton there. I'm just kind of giving you the, the short spill. But modern Christians would look at this and say, okay, Matt, um, so this has no meaning for us today. It's just all first century stuff, right? Because we're not worshiping Caesar today. We don't have images of Caesar that we're worshiping. And I would say, really? <laughs> you know, the, so, so you know, there, in the modern world, there's no such thing as as uh, corrupt political allegiances that we need to be aware of, right? There's no such thing as as putting our favorite politicians on pedestals to venerate them. Uh, maybe even, we wouldn't say this, but worship them. Uh, that is that not an issue in today's world, you know? Um, but but perhaps the mark of the beast is, is, is a fluid sort of symbol that can mean pretty much anything that draws your allegiance away from the Lamb, that draws your allegiance away from the Lamb, and embodies a very beastly, dragon-esque sort of way of living. And, and, and I, I, I put this in my book. I say something to the effect that the calling of Christians is to learn how to follow the ways of the Lamb in a world full of iconographical images of the beast. You know, and, and so, um, if anything, I feel like the view that I have argued for has immense amount of application in today's world. And in fact, I think that um, it's it's probably a very timely message for um, Christians living in a very um, a very trying time. Uh, whether this is politically, culturally, whatever, that there's a lot lot here that can be said. But in in my view, what I haven't done is say the mark of the beast is all about the final events. It's all about those times, and and it's this one thing that you know. No, it, it's, it's it, you know, Christians have lived in a world where the dragon was worshipped and the beasts were worshipped in every era. Yeah. And and this is, I'll say this last thing to answer your question on point here. If I'm correct that the mark of the beast is tied to the worship of the beast, the worship of the image of the beast, I don't suspect that this is something that you can accidentally take, right? You know, growing up, that was, you know, a number one fear for, for many evangelicals, like, oh, my goodness, my 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 driver's license has three sixes on it or something like that. I did <laughs> yeah, not right, wittingly right. take the mark of the beast right. or whatever. I'm sorry, but that has nothing to do with it. Um, you know, you have these, um, you know, I, I think it's like this, like the mark of the beast is associated with worship and worship is associated with an act of the volition, an act of the will, right? Where you're pledging your heart to the thing that you're worshiping. And, and a lot of people miss this, but... The mark of the beast isn't the most important mark in the book of Revelation. Exactly. What about the the, the seal of the lamb that goes yes. on the forehead, right? The What Kirk Keener calls the mark of the lamb. Yeah. You know, and, and by the way, you have the mark of the beast in Revelation 13, verses 16, 17, 18. The next verse, which is chapter 14, verse 1, that section starts the mark of the lamb or the seal of the lamb. And, and so that's what we should probably be preoccupied with. But I've never heard anybody in their eschatological speculation talk about taking the mark of the lamb. And I suspect it's because we know intuitively that the mark of the lamb or the seal of the lamb is, is, you know, some sort of invisible reality that it's that, um, that's about the, the person's spiritual status and so forth. And, um, and I go into all this in the book as well, but, um, you can't have, a, I'm sorry, you just can't have a conversation with about the mark of the beast without this mark of the lamb, which is a counterpoint to one another, Right. And so, um, and, the, and, and the seal of the Lamb goes on the worshipers of Christ. And, uh, you know, it's an act of volition. Who do you pledge your allegiance to? I think that's what's really being asked there about the mark of the beast. Lots more to be said about the mark, the number, and all that kind of stuff. But 
sure. but um, perhaps I'll just leave it there. Well, it's if so. There's so much to unpack from that, and I'll just say, viewers, once again, we have a, a, a childhood '80s action figure that explains this exact thing. So, Professor Beastman, right above me here, has an episode here on the channel, "The Mark of the Beast." What is it? And it unpacks so much of what Matt is talking about, and also the the notion that just because it had a referent in the first century that, that was specific doesn't mean that it doesn't apply throughout the centuries. Their Christians always have the choice of which mark do we take. And you are you're you're in my brain because I was just about to say you never hear people getting worked up about uh what's this what's the mark of the lamb? What's the mark of the lamb? Let me get that. Let me put that on my forehead. They just read that and they're like, oh, well, clearly that just means they love the Lamb or they follow the Lamb or they love Jesus. It's like, well, yeah, now you're starting to get it. So what's the opposite of that? That's probably what the Mark of the Beast is going to be much more than getting a tattoo or a vaccine or a chip implanted in your skin or something. Um, it doesn't mean you should embrace all those things. You don't go out and get barcodes sure. tattooed on your head or, you know, if somebody <laughs> says, hey, I want to put this chip under you and you can Amazon scan as you walk in and out of the grocery store. It doesn't mean that those are good ideas. It just means that that's probably not what Revelation is talking about. What Revelation is talking about is probably much more subtle and much more of a temptation for you in terms of spiritual integrity. Um, but but it's just easier to point to something tangible and go, oh, that's that's what Revelation, that's what Revelations, you got to put an S on there. That's what Revelations is talking about. That mark of the beast. I'm not getting no credit card chip in my hand. And oh, what's interesting about the mark of the beast really is how in the modern discussions it's always applied to our political opponents or something like that, right? Yes. Six, 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 seven. And and I actually think, and the, the way I've tried to craft this in the book is to say, well, wait a second. Um, the beast, the mark, and all those sorts of things might hit a lot closer to home than you realize. So let's just let's just be careful here and. Um, that there could be inst uh, instantiations of the mark of the beast in ways that you have not even considered. Yeah. Um, and I, I propose a few things there. And, and I, what I really want is Christians to just really think about the principles and the, the, the symbolic value that Revelation gives us for thinking about the ways of the beast um, so that we can so that we can uh, live the opposite as, as obedient children of, of God in following the ways of the Lamb. So yeah, it's it's a fascinating phenomenon just to see how that's applied in in the modern context. It's it really it really is, and you can't you can't get more nationalistic than the beast in Revelation. If you're reading Revelation, like the sort of epitome of a nationalist is the beast and the followers of the beast. Who can make war against the beast? Who can fight against the beast? The beast. You know, they give their allegiance to the beast, and it becomes their identity. And so then when you look at the world and you see the different, and I'm not just talking about American nationalism or Christian nationalism, but all of the nationalistic allegiances, unholy allegiances, as our friend David De Silva calls it, Revelation really starts hitting close to home. And when you study with international, like study Revelation in a group of people who weren't born in America, they will point things out that we're like, oh yeah, we, we are rather beastly in some ways that we may not have realized as, you know, Americans, or at least the system that we're in, man, Revelation just, it, it cuts through the idea of good guys and bad guys among the world leaders to me, like no other book. And it's just like, actually good guys and bad guys are the lamb and everyone else. And <laughs> the lamb is who you want to follow. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, well, we definitely have me-centered sort of interpretations of these sorts of things, like modern day, I'm mean, saying American context, because that's where I grew up, right? Right. Is that it was really interesting how, you know, growing up, all of the uh, the enemies of God were basically just enemies of America. Just happened to be America's <laughs> yeah, enemies. Just happened, totally. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, okay, well, we, we need a reading of Revelation. Again, it goes back to our assumptions. The assumption there is that it's a me-centered text, like we're the center and everything revolves around us. And and really, we need a reading of Revelation that can critique us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know how to put it. And, and, and if you're not willing to engage in a dialogue with Scripture in that sense, you're not willing to engage with Scripture in any way meaningful. Yeah, yeah. Revelation will, I mean, all of Scripture, but particularly books like Revelation, Ezekiel, Daniel, they okay. will 
challenge patriotic allegiances. Um, they will really shine a light on where your loyalties lie. And and even say, I mean, the Old Testament prophets, they were they were killed for most of the time for not being patriotic enough. You know, how dare you speak against the temple of the Lord or we're God's people, the nation yeah. has chosen. And that was when Israel was a covenant nation in covenant with God. But when people today start to speak against various world powers, even their own, you it's just it's it's not surprising, but it's sad how often that will be shut down as being unpatriotic or or you know subversive. Just, just that just that phrase world power. If we just take that phrase and say, what do we mean by that? Like world power. Um, that seems to be something that should only ever be applied to God. Like right. if it's applied to anything or any institution, any other person, it just is immediately blasphemous at that point, right? Like world power. Like uh-huh. And it really is interesting how obsessed we are with those sorts of things. But the image of the hero in Revelation is not the monsters. It's not the dragon. It's actually the weak element there, namely the slain lamb, Mm -hmm. who through being slain rescues the world, remakes the world. And at the end, if you endure Good Friday, you will have the experience of Easter Sunday. And that's the whole world will experience this. Those who follow the way of the lamb in the ways of the lamb will come out of the tomb in the new Jerusalem, and and that's the way of peace. It's a totally subversive message. It's a message that, um, well, you know, I've often said that part of the Christian gospel, uh, at the heart of the Christian gospel, is oftentimes getting people to repent of all the things that make them successful. Hmm. And I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind, that the message of the gospel is very subversive. I mean, every Sunday when I take the Eucharist, I am, I'm convicted, like I'm, face to face with the reality of the crucified lamb and and i'm like okay how have i not acted in in cruciformity this week i need to repent right and so we need a way that we are constantly being confronted with the slain lamb we need a way that so that we're constantly being confronted with with that sort of love that we are left uncomfortable and we are left forgiven so that we are empowered to go live out the ways of the lamb in a world full as I said before, with imagery of the beast. Mm-hmm. Yes, man, we could unpack it for days and days. Um, so much. Last superhero seminary plug for viewers. I know I have a lot of these, but we focus on this a lot at Disciple Dojo. Uh, Professor Lion over here behind me has a whole episode about who is the Lion of Judah and how Revelation actually turns everything on its head. And the Lion is the mm-hmm. Lamb. And we have to reorient ourselves to Revelation's upside down vision of what it means to be powerful and conquer uh, and all these other terms that the book uses incredibly ironically because of what it is as an apocalypse. Um, So let me ask you one more. We'll do one more. Um, Sure. Future tribulation. Uh, We've talked about end times, but the idea of tribulation uh, the tribu- the great tribulation, is that something that, is there going to be a future tribulation? Are we in the tribulation or is it a both and? How do you approach this issue? Yeah, that's a, that's a terrific question. I think like um, this is one of those other things that we need to check our assumptions to see if our assumptions are correct. When we think of the tribulation, we often think of, um, you know, that the, the time just before the final events or during the final events. And really, when you go back and you read the New Testament and you put on your your um, your glasses, like your newbie glasses, as if you're reading the New Testament for the very first time, you you discover that this language of tribulation is all throughout the New Testament that speaks about a future tribulation and a present tribulation. Like Jesus says in John 16, that in the world you will have flips this tribulation, but be a good share of overcome the world. And he's talking to the people around him then, saying you will have tribulation. Some of the language of the Great Tribulation um, is interesting because, I mean, I show in the book that actually the term the Great Tribulation can be applied to not something necessarily in the future or the first century, but actually in the past, you know, like the Old Testament times. And so some of the language of Great Tribulation sometimes gets, uh, well, our assumptions get the best of us, I think, and we import that language into things about the future. And I talk a lot about Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus uses a lot of that tribulation language. Mm -hmm. 
My argument is, and I follow a number of other scholars on this, is that much of Matthew 24 has to do with the first century, the, 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 the temple's destruction and so forth. Now, some of that is does have to do with um, the future, and I leave it open um, that perhaps there could be some sort of replay in the future in some way, And but I do not speculate. I don't jump into anything of that sort. In fact, I leave a lot of that open. There's just no way we can know. Um, I, I, I suspect that when it comes to the tribulation, um, <clears throat> I think it was Craig Keener, one of his books, he talks about how tribulation is actually cyclical through church history where you have ups and downs it waxes and wanes and um and i suspect that's how it's going to be until the very end um i do believe that there's going to be some sort of future final nemesis is what i call him mm-hmm. whether you call him the antichrist or um, the man of lawlessness or something to that effect of a beast per se like i think there's going to be some sort of thing institution person that seems like at the end, unfortunately, there's just not a lot we know about this person. Um, but, but um, you know, could it be that at the end, I think it's uh, Kurt Keener, again, who says something like it could intensify the tribulation that we could intensify there. Before. There's just, it's it's so hard to know about some of these details. That's the best I'll say. Yeah, possibly so. It could intensify then. But here's the thing. The whole thing for me is epistemological meaning um, has to do with what we can know like epistemology is the study of knowledge like what can a person know how do they how do you know things and so forth um so the whole thing is epistemological and what i mean by that is as soon as i say these things about the tribulation somebody could say see matt thinks there's a future intense tribulation and and, and i do say that it's very possible it could end up like that and i give my reasons in my book but then they say, oh, so Matt's pretty much in the same boat as some of these other teachers, you know, that there's a final tribulation. And so when that hits, then we, you know, we should be prepared. We should be talking about the final tribulation. We should be prepared. And I would say um, you should be prepared to go through tribulation, but there's no way that you can know. That's the epistemology. Part, there's no way that you can know that that's the final tribulation. Right. You know, you if somebody could say, well, um, yeah, you can know because that it's going to be the worst it's ever been at that point. You know, that's how you'll know it's the final tribulation. And maybe there's one guy or one person, you know, who who comes up in the midst of all that. That's that's your antichrist. That's how you know. Like, no, you don't. Like, how do you know it won't get better and then get even worse? Just because it's the worst in history at that moment doesn't mean it can't get worse or still. And 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 so we've seen this through history where you have. Uh, totalitarian, totalitarian anti-Christian figures like Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, all those people um, that we can think of, and they rise up. And if you're living in the middle of that, you probably are thinking, my goodness, is this it, right? right, right. But obviously it wasn't. And and so so there's just no way that we can know but, and th- th- that it's ever going to be the end. We are called to be faithful through every trial and tribulation that we encounter, whether we're living under Nero or Domitian, or Diocletian, or Hitler, or whatever, we need to be faithful to Jesus in in as followers of the Lamb under the rule of tyrants and beasts like that. Mm-hmm. And so I follow, uh, I mentioned Craig Keener a moment ago, I follow some of his thinking on this, is that he, he actually says that there's, there's really no way that even Satan knows who the final Antichrist would be, because, um, you know, we don't know, I mean, he doesn't know when Jesus will return, he doesn't know uh, when the last guy will be the last guy. He always has someone ready to go. You know, mm-hmm. that's something that Craig Keener said. I, I cite that in the book. Mm-hmm. And and so my my point again is all epistemological in this sense is like, guys, there's just no way we can know. There's no way that you can know. Yeah. What you can do is today be faithful to King Jesus and tomorrow be faithful to King Jesus. And here's how you know it's the final tribulation. Here's how you know it's the final Antichrist. When Jesus shows up and puts them all to bed, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that, that's how you know, right? And that, that's the argument I use in the book. Craig has talked about this a lot too, as, as I recall. And so so that's my thing. Um, and, uh, you know, my book, I'm not, again, I mentioned at the beginning, I, I don't have all the answers, partly because I have a lot more to learn, but also partly because I don't think you can, can have all the answers. Right. I think right. that many of these answers won't happen until we have certain experiences, until we experience certain things then we can go back and read the, the Bible afresh and maybe we can come up with these things. But there, I, I say this, there's just a lot we can't know and we need to be content with that. And, well, I, and I actually, I, 
I, yeah, let me say this. I think it's important. You know, whenever John, you know, the rumor was spreading that uh, St. John was, you know, possibly going to be left alive when Jesus returns, and everybody's kind of speculating at this point about John's, you know, is he, the, you know, going to be around then? I, I, I draw a parallel today is that we often talk about, are we the final generation? You have these Christians saying, we're the final generation. And like, Jesus's response is, look, none of that's your concern. You follow me. You right. follow me, and 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 that's how I think Christians should live their lives. Yeah, yeah. It's it. If you look at it as, like you mentioned, Keener saying uh, Satan doesn't know, so he's got a number ready to go. You know, it, it's very. That's really similar. Sean McDonough said it uh, a lot in class. He would say he hmm. likes to think of this um, undercurrent of evil, like of anti. Hmm. God that flows throughout history and periodically erupts to the surface in, you know, yeah. the Diocletian persecutions or the persecution of Christians in Japan uh, or, you know, whatever. Like it, it erupts every now and then. Maybe at the end there will be a final, you know, cataclysmic geyser of evil that arises in this Antichrist beast figure. But that doesn't detract from how beastly each of the previous ones are, right. and that we have to live as if that is what Scripture is talking about, because for us it is. And so knowing, once you take off the speculative lenses of, of end times chart making, it frees the message of Revelation to be applicable to yes. the things in our lives that we wouldn't even think fit on a major world eschatological scene, but that could be every bit as important from an eternal perspective. You know, the decision we make, these little, that nobody will ever see. Um, it, it, Revelation says, actually, those daily decisions you're making have eternal significance, and, and you are choosing daily whose mark you're taking through your allegiance to the Lamb or your acquiescence to the beast. Um, and it's, it, it just, it, that, that's the best, that's why I like teacher revelation and mm -hmm. want to encourage people to read your book and to go deeper in their own study of eschatology is because it frees scripture from the shackles that we put on it when we just try to make it a newspaper headlines written in advance kind of thing. And so mm -hmm. many Christians have done it. And I, I don't question, like you said earlier, I don't question the sincerity of people who have built their entire careers off of predicting the end times. Uh, some I do. There, there are some I legitimately think are wolves in sheep's clothing. But in general, I look at it as I don't question their sincerity or even their love for the Lord. But I do question their wisdom and their, uh, their recklessness. In, in confidently proclaiming stuff. And so we'll get, I'll get chan I'll get comments here on the channel as Disciple Dojo continues to grow. One of the good things is we're reaching more people. One of the bad things is we get more trolls. And a number of the troll comments that I get sometimes will have to do with if I don't take a stand on an issue. Like when I review a study Bible and I'm like, hey, they don't, they just present the options and they allow you. And I think that's a good thing. And people would be like, you need, you know, you don't even know what you believe or you're just, whatever, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, very wishy-washy. And for first order doctrines, of course, that would be a bad thing. Like, oh, I don't know if Jesus rose from the dead. Right. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. No, no, that's anathema. Right. But for most other things, it should be the way we do it. It should be the approach we take. And that's what I really liked. That's why I recommended your book so strongly on my social media when I was reading it was like, this is doing exactly what we should do when we come to eschatology in particular is saying, okay, here's what we can know, but most of this we can't. And, and that's okay because God doesn't want us to, he wants us to live in light of what we can know. Um, so folks read, yeah. read Matt's book for sure. Read his book when it comes out, but they can pre-order it right now. Right. Do you know? Yeah, it's available uh, wherever books are sold okay. pre-order. Yeah. Okay, well, at least, yeah, I'll put a link and pre-order it. Um, folks, definitely check the book out. This is this has been a great conversation, and I, I I would just encourage everybody to, you know, not get preoccupied with Antichrist, but 
get preoccupied with Christ, you know, focus on the gospel and yes. what God has done for us through, um, through Christ. And, and, you know, oftentimes we, we see a lot of this eschatological fervor focused on the final antichrist. And really what we see in the new Testament is that, that when there is a final nemesis, that it's, you know, it's, it's always in the sense of thank God there's a final one and we can get on with our eternal, um, worship of the Lord and so forth. And so, the emphasis is not upon the bad guys. The emphasis is always upon Jesus as the truly human person. And so I would just invite everybody to come. Yeah, I, I know a lot of people have, have fled the waters of Revelation and, and Times text, but come on back. The water's safe. And um, and just enjoy eschatology as the study of how God will one day wipe away every tear that you ever had. And as one person once so eloquently said, it, he will make all the sad things untrue. And that's what our hope is in. Beautifully said. Absolutely. Eschatology should instill hope for those who are walking with the Lord. Um, trepidation for those who aren't, for sure. But for those who are, the saddest thing in the world to me is when Christians say, I tried reading Revelation, but it's just too scary. And I just think, oh, irony of ironies. The, the book that was written to make things the most comforting for Christians going through the worst nightmare has become something that's a source of fear rather than encouragement. And uh, so there are resources out there that are helping to turn the tide on that. And I recommend Matt. Um, I recommend the Disciple Dojo podcast. This is just a prop. You don't have to buy any CDs. It's free. It's on our podcast to download, as is our course, Revelation, a guided tour of the apocalypse. This is chapter by chapter. We walk through the entire book and point out a lot of the stuff that Matt and I talked about in this discussion and just unpack it a lot more. Um, there's also a free downloadable workbook with bibliography resources and everything. So Disciple Dojo, we are very, very serious about being an, somewhat of an antidote to all of the junk food out there when it comes to end times teachings and to, to just l let people see the lamb for who he is and that he wins and that we need to just follow him and everything else will take care of itself. That doesn't mean we don't study. That doesn't mean we don't have curiosities. That doesn't mean we don't ask those questions. We do. Um, we just ask them being willing to hold the answers with loose hands when it's something that we can't know. So Matt, thank you. Thank you for writing the book now that I don't, I don't have to because you've written it. So I can just point people to your book if they ask and say, hey, I'm glad you asked. Here's the book that I would have written or something very, not probably not as good, but something very much similar to it. Uh, so man, thank you for that and, and for your ministry and just for coming on and talking to us. I think it's great that folks are getting to, to hear people excited about eschatology um, instead of the sensationalism and, and the angst and the doom scrolling and all the stuff that people get caught up in. So where can viewers, if they want to reach out to you or they want to connect with you or see um, you know, follow up in any way? Is there a way that they can get in touch with you? Maybe they want you to come speak at their church or something like that. What, how, how can people reach you? Yeah, I, I think the best way to reach me would be, I, I have a website, um, matthewhalsa.com and there's a contact form that goes straight to my email. I'm happy to, to uh, receive messages and, and whatnot. I'm on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all, right. all the all of those. Um, I have not jumped onto TikTok yet. I, I wouldn't even know what to do once I was on it. You know, TikTok um, may be the mark of the beast. I retract everything I just said. <laughs> I, I may it might be TikTok. Uh, it could it very be, well yeah. be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not tech savvy. So, but yeah, I'm on all of those. So please feel free to reach out anytime. Yeah, Matt. Thanks for coming by and and stepping in the dojo. We're gonna have to have you back on again. This your this is your white belt appearance. Next time you come back, you'll be a blue belt guest. Uh, we follow the jujitsu belt rankings. So, but you're always, seriously, you're always welcome here anytime. If you ever want to just say like, Hey, I want to talk about something. Do not hesitate to shoot me a message and say, this would be an interesting thing to chat about uh, because I would absolutely be up for it. Well, thank you so much. You've been very kind and thank you for your kind words. They're very encouraging to me. And um, thank you uh, to the audience. And I pray that your tribe increases. Uh, thank you for your YouTube channel. And, and I pray that your ministry uh, increases as well. We need we need more more of your content out there. Well, we will do our best, and you keep doing your best. And uh, Disciple Dojo will bridge the gap between the work you're doing in academia and the hungry people out there that want access to it. So that's what we're all about. 
Thanks for watching. It was such a pleasure to just sit and chat uh, to talk shop with Matthew about a subject that we're both very interested in and, and really enjoy teaching on. So it's really cool to be able to do that here at Disciple Dojo. If you appreciated this discussion, we'd love for you, if you haven't already, to click the subscribe button and hit the little notifications bell. That You wouldn't believe how big a difference that makes, but it really does. I'm going to put links in the video description below to Matt's book, so you can pre-order that. I'm going to put links to our Apocalypse Now podcast series, our Revelation, a guided tour of the Apocalypse video course all entirely free here on the channel and i'll also link to a copy of my book which i don't have a hard copy of but it's available on amazon you want to be left behind essays having to do with the end times and in addition to those i'll also put links to some of the other books and works that we mentioned in our discussion for those of you viewers who want to go deeper in your understanding of what the bible actually does and doesn't teach when it comes to things having to do with end times. So be sure to check the video description below. As always, thanks for watching. Stay tuned here for more great Bible nerdiness at Disciple Dojo. And in the meantime, as always, keep training.